I ask you to describe the city of London today, you'd probably describe one of the biggest and most important cities in, in the world, one of the financial centers of the capital. It's just an essential part of, of Western civilization. That has not always been the case, though. If you go far enough back into history, it actually was once the backwoods. Britain was once the, the weird place where those uh, rural folks lived that no one under, understand from the city. And, and you got to go back to the second, third, and fourth century for this to be the case. But once upon, the time, once upon a time, London was just way out there, far rural lands. If you've ever heard of Hadrian's Wall, that was a wall the Emperor Hadrian built in the second century to control those wild, uncontrollable hordes of people up there that no one else could get a handle on. So he built a wall to keep them away. Well, if you go forward a couple centuries to the fifth century, uh, there, it's still not really settled, so to speak, but there are some people in, in, in Britain and uh, in that area, and there are a couple churches, a couple monastic communities, and in one monastic community, there's a dude named Pelagius. And Pelagius is rather, well, shall we say, intense. Very, very intense. The intensity of his faith is such that it actually shapes the world moving forward, and here is why. He got tired of hearing people make excuses. He got tired of hearing people say, you know, I, I just was tempted and I gave in. I'm just a sinner. I can't help it. He got tired of hearing people give excuses for being less than perfect. And so he, his, his solution was people needed to try harder. You just need to try harder. If, you, if you're messing up in your life, just try harder. That, that, that's what his response was day in and, and day out. That uh, you should stop being a pushover for Jesus. Try harder. And... Um, he was taking this intensity, this approach to life with him when he eventually traveled to Rome in the 5th century, early 5th century. He goes to Rome. And once upon a time, Rome would have been a great place for him to hang out because once upon a time, Rome was this city full of very serious and intent people. Rome was the, the capital of as far as I know, the largest empire to ever exist. It was the capital of the known world, of, of all the Mediterranean, all, all the northern Mediterranean, around the Middle East, all the southern Mediterranean to, to North Africa. And the only places they hadn't conquered were the places they didn't want to bother with. The Africa turned into a desert and they didn't want to deal with it and they didn't want to go any farther east because they just don't want to deal with that either. And so, once upon a time, Rome was the head of this great and magnificent empire full of serious people who are just as intense as Pelagius and uh and part of that, if you look at the Roman psyche, their understanding of a person was different than ours. We believe that no matter what, a person has a body and a soul. You can be sitting there all day long, you can get up and work all day long, but you always have body and soul. The Roman understanding was, if you weren't doing something, you didn't have a soul. A soul is something you develop by doing. And if you were just sitting there as a slug on the couch watching TV, at that moment you had no soul because you weren't up doing anything. And and so if you have that sort of approach to life, you can see how that would drive people to be just doers. They, they, were serious, they built aqueducts and built roads that we can still use today. They were just so... That was, that was what Rome used to be. But the, by the time Pelagius shows up, though, that Rome has faded. And, and instead, uh, it, it's kind of a, a trope now, the story of the decline of Rome due to the dec decadence of, of, of Rome. And, and that's what Pelagius shows up to find. He doesn't show up to find that there are serious people doing serious work in Rome. He shows up to find that the city has gone to pot. It's... Uh, it's the stereotypical story of the rural country boy goes to the city and, and says, what, what are you people doing? You all are crazy here. You all are just mo loose morals, loose everything. And, and, and he gets to the city and, and that's what he finds. It's a city of decadence and degradation. And, uh, and so he keeps on preaching his, his, his message even louder. You know, you all need to shape up and just try harder to follow Jesus. And you need to be committed to this. And uh, there are people who gather to this. There's always people who are critiquing modern culture, even in the 5th the century. And, and so Pelagius gets popular. People are gathering to his what he is preaching, that everyone just needs to try harder. And... Um, 
this starts to get people's attention. The churches across the world gather to figure out what are we going to do about this guy named Pelagius? Because as he is pushing farther, he is pushing this idea, it's not enough just to try harder. You, if you try harder, you can avoid sin altogether, is what he starts to teach people. Because sin is not a condition, it's an action, it's something you do. And if you just try hard enough, you, you just don't sin anymore. You just got to try hard. And if, you're not, and if you are sinning, then you're not trying hard enough. And if you're not going to try harder, you can just go ahead and burn in hell, would be what he would say. Did, remember, he's kind of an intense fellow. That, that's what shows up on occasion. And, and he does this because he has a solution to, to the problem of people sinning. He sh people should be more like him. And uh, that's the solution to a lot of problems in life, right? You should just be more like me because I got it figured out. That's how we tend to... Uh, share our, prop, our solutions. But his, solu his solution to the problem of sin is people need to try harder and join monastic communities and get together and follow Jesus together. And, and he pushes this even further and he says that every child is born without sin, born just like Adam, because if you, and so if you just raise a child right, they would never sin. And you don't have to baptize children because they're born perfect. And if they're raised correctly so that they try hard enough, they never sin, they'll never need to be baptized. And, and so this is getting people's opinion, uh, attention. And, and people are gathering. And, and, and the bishops of the churches of the world get together in, in Carthage in 418. And... and they agree that Pelagius is wrong. That we are broken and sinners. That sin is not just an action, it's a condition. And that we need the help of the church and the Bible and the Holy Spirit to be able to see and understand this. And it's a sign of how broken we can be that we'd even attempt to say that we're not broken. And, um, and so they say Pelagius is wrong and he doesn't take this well. And he, he goes off to travel to Egypt and we lose track of him and we never hear him again. But that was... A moment in the early church when we had, when the church had to figure out what do we really think about sin and children and inf infants. And you might ask, why are we talking about this today? Why, why are you hearing this ancient history? It is not just so I can pull out. This is one of my favorite books. I have an encyclopedia of heretics, and this is awesome. This is really. In, there's a story of idiocy on every page in here, but uh, it's not just so I can tell you about a fun early heresy. It's because those heresies still are around. And I was asked by someone here in the area, it was in Green City, I was asked a question a few weeks ago. That person was cornered and asked about children and original sin. And how can we believe that children are born as anything other than innocent and pure and perfect? And why would we ever have to baptize children? And, and, and this person's response was original sin. And, and, and the other person said, well, show it to me in the Bible. And this person didn't know exactly what to do. So she came to me and said, Andy, help. And so now I'm giving you the answer today. Uh, well, I already gave that person the answer in Green City. I'm giving you the answer too. Um, because it's still a, a question that comes up. We, and we don't tend to really delve into the details of sin as often, but this does seem a very appealing idea that children are just born perfect and innocent, and if, they just, if we just raise them right and they try hard enough, they'll never, they'll never sin, right? And, and this hot, whole idea of trying harder, doesn't that feel so very American? You know, if you have a problem, what should you do? Try harder. And if you can't solve that problem, what does that mean? You didn't try hard enough. And if you're still, if you can't make enough money to get by, what should you do? Try harder. And if you still can't get enough money, what's that mean? You weren't trying hard enough. And, and so this is the attitude we can sort of fall into. If, you, if you're struggling with sin, what should you do? You should try harder. And if you're still sinning, what does that mean? Well, you're obviously not trying. Just try harder and you'll be able to, to do this. And well, that, that, it's a tempting idea. But I don't think that's really what the Bible is teaching us. So if we, we look at the, what the Bible does say, first we've got to confess that the Old Testament doesn't actually say much about uh, original sin. In fact, it says nothing about it. It talks about sin. It talks about how when, uh, when Cain and Abel have their little spat in Genesis 4, uh, God says to Cain, you've got to watch out because sin is crouching at the door. It's lurking at the door to get you. You must master it. And isn't that a terrifying mental image that sin is lurking at the door and you open the door and sin's going to get you. I mean, so the Old Testament does talk about sin as this force, this something, this, this power that's going to get you, but it never really talks about children. 
And so you have to go to the New Testament to talk about original sin. But something happens between the end of the Old Testament, about 600 B.C., and the beginning of the, Old, of the New Testament, 600 years later. The ideas around sin develop, but they get developed so that by the time you get to the New Testament, it's assumed, but not talked about. No one in the New Testament ever explicitly says, children are born sinners. It doesn't exist. And so if you're asked, where is original sin in the Bible and in the New Testament, there is no one place you can look at and say, there it is, right there. Paul said, or Jesus said, or John said, children are born with sin. It's not there. What there is are passages like what we read earlier. No one is righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And does all include children? Well, yes, all does include children. And so all people, including children, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Later in the letter, he talks about this some more, about how all have sinned in Romans 5. And in Romans 6, he says, uh, The wages of sin are death. Have you ever met a person that lived forever? Nope. And so all people were born with sin because they die of, of sin at some point. And so yes, a, a child, it, it feels tempting to say all child, children are born innocent and if they just try hard enough they, they would never sin. But you know, that's just not what the Bible is assuming and it's not our, our take on it either. We, it's not our experience of this, that, that children are perfect. Um, not in that way. And so, does Jesus have anything to say about this? No. And, and this is one of those places where we have to kind of argue from silence, which is not a strong place to argue from, but Paul says pretty clearly that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Paul is trained as a Jew in the first century, and Jesus is trained as a Jew in the first century. And so their training was probably very similar. And so if Jesus had disagreed with this, he probably would have said something. Because there are multiple times Jesus says, you have heard it say, said, but I say unto you. Jesus changes the law a couple places in pretty dramatic fashion. And so if Jesus was going to change something, he would have, I think changed this. And so what we're left with is the early church fathers who after Jesus' resurrection and, and all the churches, the churches are gathering, they've got to figure out what do we think about some of these things. And, and connecting the dots, there are people like Tertullian and Origen and, and Justin Martyr uh, who, who sit down and, and they figure out that you know Jesus never explicitly says that children are born sinners. Paul assumes it, and that seems to be where we're going to stand. If, you want, if someone asks you, what do you st where does the Bible say that children are born with original sin? You can't say, this is where it says children are born with original sin. But what you can say is, Paul says, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and all includes children. Right. And so Augustine then goes a little bit further and defines this. And I find his definitions very satisfying. He says, original sin is an imbalance between passion and reason. Right? Every child is born with an imbalance between passion and reason. My daughter is two. There is no better description of my daughter than that phrase right there. She has an imbalance between her passion and reason. <laughs> or temper tantrums, if you just want to use the, the phrase we all know. Right? And that's a condition we all are born with. We all are born with the condition of having our passion and our reason being out of balance. It manifests itself in various ways, but that's the truth of, of our lives. We are all born with that imbalance, that, that condition. Now, you could ask, what about children who die at a young age before they can choose to follow Jesus? Uh, Jesus is the one who looked upon Jerusalem and said, uh, "I wish to gather you like a mother chick gathers her, her a mother hen gathers her chicks." I, I'm not all that worried about young children who die, but our Lord's going to take care of them. And so, why does this matter today? Why does it matter to hear uh, of this? Uh, 4th century, 5th century heretic, why does it matter to be able to say clearly that children are born less than perfect with this imbalance between passion and reason? I think it's important for two reasons. First, it reaffirms how important it is to raise children well. It reaffirms the absolute critical just task of raising children well. because Not because they're perfect people, 
perfect little people to coddle, but because they are born with this condition of being a sinner and they need to be formed. Every child needs to be formed such that their passions and their reason is in balance, such that they are able to follow Jesus and confess their own sins, such that they are able to handle themselves as a follower of Jesus. It is not that children are born perfect and we need to keep them perfect. It's that children are born with this condition of original sin and we need to help raise them so that they can handle that in following Christ. And it does take a community too. If your kids are out of the house, well, you're not done raising kids. You're just going to help other people raise their kids now. And so that's the first reason. It reaffirms that uh, children are not perfect to coddle, but broken to raise and, and help be able to follow Jesus. The second reason I think it's important to pay attention to this is it's a, it's a way for us to handle our great American tendency to look at any problem and say, try harder. Isn't that what we do? You know, if they just try harder, they'd be able to fix their lives. If they just try harder, just try harder. You can't get a job, try harder. You've got to get your life in, in check, try harder. And, and sometimes try harder is the exact right thing to, to say, and sometimes it just doesn't work just doesn't make sense. All people are made in the image of God and thus wonderful and capable of beautiful things but all people are also broken by original sin and there are places where the response to brokenness in other people's lives is not to say try harder but for us to be more graceful and be more patient with how hard they're already trying. Amen.